Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to Appreciative Inquiry Community Development Discussion. My name is Onu Romano. I am the co-organizer of CFIC Victoria branch, branch manager for the virtual branch and a board member. CFIC is Canada's only national nonprofit with the mission of promoting and educating the public on critical thinking, science and secularism. We help people to make decisions based on evidence, rational thinking and compassion. In alignment with our mission, we hold events like these to provide an opportunity for subject matter experts, intellects, and free thinkers to engage with you. Most recently, we have moved many of these events online. To minimize background noise, we have put everyone on mute. If you wish to speak, please raise your hand. I myself will be moderating. I will acknowledge that I've seen your raised hand by writing your name in the chat window. When the opportunity presents itself, you will be unmuted and have the opportunity to ask a question. We rely entirely on donations and memberships to allow us bring you events such as this. Please visit our website or email me for more information about how to become a member or make a donation. Appreciative inquiry is a strength-based positive approach to leadership development and organizational change. Appreciative inquiry can be used by organizations, teams, and societies to determine a best way forward through creating a shared vision of the future and having strategic innovation. This presentation will look at the basic tenets of and philosophies of appreciative inquiry and how it can be used within the change management process. This is an important conversation to have in light of the changes brought by the novel coronavirus. I also happen to be enrolling in a Master of Arts program in Discipline of Global Leadership at Royal Roads. And since, is, since this is directly related to my field of study, I have been looking forward for this talk, as many of you do. Now, I would like to have my colleague Farley Cates of the CFIC Victoria branch to introduce you to this evening's speaker. Hello, Farley. Thank you, Honor. I, uh... I first off want to uh, also acknowledge the uh, University of Victoria and their speaker a series of, a program. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Uh, Makakoro. Patrick Makakoro is a development practitioner with extensive experience working in community and international development. And I, of course, look very much forward to that tonight because uh, my background is in planning and in community development. Patrick is a dedicated child's rights activist and is passionate about social justice issues worldwide. His experience working with children at an orphanage led him to establish the Naka Prana Foundation, a charitable organization that provides education, meals, health care, counseling, and other essential services to orphaned and vulnerable children throughout Zimbabwe. Beginning in 2012, he founded the Zimbabwe Network of Early Childhood Development Actors, a national umbrella organization for organizations working in the early years sector. Through this organization, Patrick has designed, led, and managed projects supporting over 40,000 children. Patrick has also carried out research on early childhood and community development, which have informed national, educational, policy development initiatives. Patrick is also a founding member of the Africa Early Childhood Network headquartered in Nairobi, Kenya, which works to champion the development needs of young children in Africa. Patrick's an alumnus of the Mandela Washington Fellowship, the World Forum Global Leader for Young Children Fellow, and serves on the board of directors of the World Forum Foundation. The Naka Foundation and Zenecta. He has also previously served as regional director for Africa at Childhood Educational International in Washington, D.C. Patrick has a BA in Community Development from the University of South Africa, a postgraduate diploma in International Youth and Child Care from the University of Victoria, 
uh, an, a Master of Science in Development Studies. He is currently a doctoral candidate at University of Victoria in the Faculty of Education, Department of Curriculum and Instruction, and uh, has just informed me that uh, hopefully I'll have his doctorate, but I'm sure he will by uh, late <laughs> winter, early spring. Yeah. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Patrick and look forward to his talk. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you very much, uh, Farley, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Ona, as well, uh, for, uh, for just the kind uh, introduction. Um, I'm going to just uh, share with folks just the uh, presentation that I have here, um, and we'll be able to sort of walk through and go through uh, the contents uh, that I have. Let me just uh, share my screen. There we go. Great, thank you uh, so much uh, once again, Fali um, and 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 Ona, and my again profound you know gratitude goes to the Center for uh, Inquiry for giving me the space to to share uh, some of the work that I've done around appreciative inquiry. My presentation tonight will sort of you know look just follow the flow that I have in front of you. Um, sort of look at what is appreciative inquiry, uh, discuss sort of the four step cycle that we have within the context of appreciative inquiry. Look at some practical examples uh, where I have applied appreciative inquiry. Uh, both in Africa as well as in North America, um, and then look at some of the lessons that I've learned uh, at a personal level, at an organizational level, uh, as well as sort of at an international development uh, level. Um, and then following that, I'll be able to sort of provide a conclusion uh, in terms of just some concluding uh, remarks before we open up the space uh, for a conversation. And so just to start uh, start off, um, appreciate Appreciative Inquiry really uh, was founded based on the idea that you know, sort of David Cooper Ryder, uh, who is now a university professor uh, at Case Western Reserve uh, in the US. And um, part of the remarks that I loved uh, a few years ago that he said, you know, he said that it is time for us to rethink human organization and change and sort of move out of our mindsets, the deficit based modalities. Um, as well as sort of, you know, uh, remove our, you know, the cynicism um, against you know, sort of the very idea of, of planned change. And so the foundations of appreciative inquiry um, were really coming out of, you know, him working, you know, on his sort of doctoral program uh, back in the early 80s, uh, working with his supervisor, Suresh Srivasta, um, you know, uh, just beginning to think about how best to support organizational change and organizational development uh, more from a positive, a strength-based approach as opposed to a deficit uh, or a negative uh, sort of, you know, mindset. And um, just currently, as I was preparing for this, you know, presentation, I've seen that many universities around the world really reference, um, you know, the use of appreciative inquiry and also, uh, you know, Currently, I know, uh, you know, the University of Victoria, Royal Roads University, uh, McMaster, I think university as well, really formally teach, you know, concepts around uh, appreciative inquiry. And so just to give a little bit of a head, you know, sort of awareness of what, you know, appreciative inquiry is, is basically just a strength based approach, you know, that is, look, you know, that we use in community development or international development, where we focus more on the strength, the successes, the positives, um, as opposed to looking at the problems uh, and the negatives. So many a time you have you know folks talking about you know is the glass half empty or is the glass half full and so with appreciative inquiry we are always looking at the half full perspective where we are saying you know we have a better situation we are not coming from a negative perspective but we are coming from a positive uh, perspective and so when i look at defining appreciative inquiry i sort of separated the two words you know appreciative 
and, and, and inquiry. And when we look at appreciative, you know, the dictionary version, uh, you know, in terms of giving us a definition of this word is sort of, you know, the act of recognizing the best that we have in people, the best that we have uh, in the world around us. It also helps us to look at affirming the past and, you know, present strengths, you know, the successes and the potential that we have, as well as you know, sort of, you know, second definition coming around, you know, perceiving those things that give life. So whether it's health, it's, you know, vitality is excellence um, so that we see those from a you know a positive uh, frame of reference um, <clears throat> the other you know sort of definition around appreciative is to sort of you know to appreciate is to really increase in value is to sort of you know when you look at for example the economy you say the economy is appreciated in value when you look at your savings you know and the interest that you're earning earning on those you say they've appreciated in value or you know when you look at the stock market you look at the appreciation and value of your stocks so really you're looking at sort of the increase in value of whatever you hold and again as i'll explain further in my presentation is sort of looking at how we appreciate that which we have either as a community as a people as a family or as a country or as a world um, and then you know synonyms that that come through uh, include sort of valuing in terms of, you know, esteeming or honoring or pricing or holding in high regard that which we have uh, in our in our position. And then when we look at sort of the word inquiry, uh, it sort of helps us to look at uh, provides us a lens where we can see, you know, inquiry as an act of exploration, an act of discovery. Um, you know, when you're inquiring about something, you're asking, you know, a question, you're being open to see the new potentials that, you know, might exist in a certain situation. Um, and so the synonyms that you have are sort of discovery, uh, search, studying, um, as well as sort of having um, a, a systematic exploration uh, of, of issues. So really to inquire is to explore, is to have that, you know, discovery lens on, uh, is to be able to sort of look beyond what we already know and say, hey, we want to look into, uh, into new answers. And so moving from the, um, you know, appreciative inquiry as a concept, as a principle, as a paradigm, has you know sort of you know the core principles that we we go by and these are sort of five uh, core principles and I'll sort of paraphrase so that you know I don't bore you with uh, with, with with what is written there. You've got the con constructive history principle, uh, which is basically where we talk about you know inquiry is being you know being able uh, to generate new stories, language, and ideas. So, for example, as a researcher myself, I come from the sort of social constructivist uh, perspective where I believe that we have stories that are being told by people, by communities that help to create the world uh, that we live in. And then appreciative inquiry also operates around the basis of simultaneity, where the you know answers are implicit within the questions that I asked, uh, that are asked within communities. Uh, many a time we do talk about you sort of you know the answer that you get is as good as the question that you ask, right? And so if you ask a very good question, you are bound to be able to 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 get a very good answer. And so we'll talk some more when I give you some practical examples of how I've employed. Uh, deployed uh, the appreciative inquiry concept when it comes to asking questions. And then you've got the poetic principle, which is, you know, a story is always, whether of an organization or of a community, uh, is always being co-authored by people that live that, you know, story, you know, being told by people that co-live uh, the situation uh, in a community, in a country, in a family. And so uh, it is always important for practitioners to choose a topic that sort of engage and can change the organization. We have uh, what we call the participatory, uh, anticipatory uh, principle, where we have to understand our actions guided by the vision that we have for the future uh, by being able to create a positive image uh, of the future so that we're able to shape the present action. So, if we know the future that we want. So talk about, uh, um, you know, uh, a, a green future. We talk about a future that has got sort of um, 
less exposure uh, to, 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 to sort of you know, the fuels that, that we are using right now. And so if we want to go energy efficient, we sort of imagine a future where we are all energy efficient, right? And so how do we use that future to, how do we think about that future and then position that to make the correct decisions now? So how do we go green? How do we begin to deploy sort of solar technology? How do we begin to sort of begin to use electric vehicles, electric cars, so that there's less carbon monoxide and pollution uh, so that we have a sort of a, a greener future? So if we start with the future in mind, we can then take you know, sort of steps backwards to be able to help us uh, think about a future that we, we, a green future that we would want. Um, and then the last principle is uh, the positive principle, where again, as an organization uh, or organizations or families or communities, we need to have uh, what we call positive sentiments, you know, for example, hope, inspiration, uh, a sense of camaraderie, where we are able to strengthen ourselves through the social bonds that we have. Now we live in difficult times. You know, the coronavirus has brought in uh, unprecedented, you know, unprecedented loss. You know, families have lost loved ones, communities have lost loved ones, communities have lost pillars. Um, and so, how do we begin to find strength, even in, though we are in the middle of a tragedy? How do we begin or a pandemic? How do we begin to find strength by the social bonds that that exist within us? So those are sort of the five uh, principles that you know we use and operate. Uh, from when we're talking about uh, appreciative inquiry. So I'm going to move from sort of this definition lens and, um, and take you uh, to what we call the four-step cycle. And basically, uh, the four-step cycle is what we use when we are uh, you know, working in, for example, when I work with communities, both at a local level, whether it's in sort of developing countries or it's developed countries, is we go through these four Ds. Um, discovery, dream, design, and destiny. And so in discovery, we are looking at where are we now as a people? Where are we now as a community? Where are we now as an organization? What is the strategic context that informs the reality of now? Now, within that reality, we are then saying, what are the positive issues or aspects that we have that can carry us forward. And this is the positive core. So once we identify the positive core or we identify the positive issues that help us carry forward, we are then able to move to the next stage and say with this positive that we have. So for example, in the midst of a pandemic like coronavirus, we can find that an organization has a dedicated staff as God, you know, committed uh, customers who believe in the brand as God, you know, if you're looking at a community level, you've got a community that believes so much in one ideal and they want to be able to bring forward the energies that they have. And so this positive core allows us to move to the dreams phase. And within the dream phase, we are beginning to look and say, hey, what is it that we want, for example, for the future of our children? If I'm working in a, in a developing country or a developed country uh, where there are poor resources and there's sort of insufficient uh, support for young children, what do we want for our young children? Do we want our young children to access education? Do we want our children to access health? Do we want them to access uh, sort of services that help nature them, that help them to grow into, be, you know, into being responsible uh, citizens of, of, of a country? And so we want to then dream about a purpose. We also want to be able to have a vision that allows us to be able to move forward. And so in a community setting, as an example, a couple of examples that I will share uh, later on will show is that in a community setting, you then sit and facilitate a conversation with community members and say, hey, what do we dream for our community? So currently I am in uh, beautiful Langford, uh, Victoria, which is in beautiful British Columbia. And so, you know, when we think about, and when I think about the future within my community, I say, wow, you know, I want this community to be greener. I want us to consume less sort of fossil fuels and go green. And so for us to be able to do that, what are the issues that we need to focus on? And so once we go past the dream phase, we go to the design. So how are we going to have relationships and organization that will allow us to move forward our dream so that it becomes an implement you know it becomes an implementable um, idea or an implementable dream. So how do we be 
we, we how do we start having conversations uh, within our social networks, within our professional networks, uh, conversations around, hey, if we want to grow green uh, in, in, in Langford, these are the necessary steps that we need to take. So let's engage the mayor, let's engage the town planner, let's engage the councillors so that we're able to have a conversation about how our city uh, or our town, you know, begins to represent the ideals uh, of, of the dream that we have. And so from the design phase, we then move to destiny. And so destiny is where we want to be. So how do we structure ourselves? How do we create a situation where we are structured? How do we create a situation where we've got a structure that speaks into our, our dream? How do we have a structure that speaks into how we have designed um, our, our, our future? And so with that, we then create uh, sort of through our relationships, begin to think about who is going to fund uh, you know, this, this project, who is going to fund, you know, us going to green, what are the issues, are we going to have to self fund ourselves, how do we create enough revenue, create enough resources, both financial and in kind, for us to be able to move forward our, our dream. And as we do that, we are also looking at implementation. What are the issues that we need to address? What are the issues that we need to look at so that we're able to implement uh, the dream uh, that, that we have? And so basically, these are the sort of four Ds uh, that come through in appreciative inquiry, where we are having a conversation. Uh, these conversations can be, you know, around the tree when you're, you know, in, in, in Africa. And I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a native of, of, of Zimbabwe. I come from Zimbabwe. And so if I'm in, in the field and in the communities in Zimbabwe, we are sitting, you know, under a tree with a beautiful shade. And we've got men, women, we've got everybody from the community that has managed to attend a meeting, you know, coming in. And we, I'm facilitating a conversation where we are talking about what does the future look like for this community and how do you want, uh, you know, sort of your dreams to turn out into, uh, into reality. And so having unpacked that uh, sort of four-step cycle, I want to take you through uh, sort of, you know, practice where, you know, um, appreciative inquiry has, 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 has been deployed and have been, you know, sort of using it. Um, and so as Farley sort of, you know, highlighted uh, in his introduction, you know, I founded the NACA Foundation uh, in 2008, which is 12 years ago, uh, as an organization really to support orphans and vulnerable children. Um, at that time, Zimbabwe had sort of the highest, you know, uh, number of orphans, uh, you know, within Southern Africa and indeed in, in, in Africa. And so the, the, the burden on my heart was, as a Zimbabwean, what can I do to support young children in need? What can I do to ensure that the children have got a life uh, that is full of possibilities? Because I always want to come from a, 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 you know, a perspective where the glass is half full rather than the glass is half empty. So how can children live a life full of possibilities? And so Naka itself is a Shona word, and Shona is you know one of the eleven languages that are spoken in Zimbabwe. Um, and so Naka means inheritance. And so for me, uh, the inspiration was what inheritance do I want to give to the orphans and the vulnerable children? What is it that they can inherit so that they are also able to have a life full of uh, possibilities? And inheritance, you know, uh, became, you know, that word that formed and became the name of an organization. And so I'll take you through just a few sort of, you know, projects that we've done um, within Zimbabwe and some work that I've done in the USA that I'm currently, in fact, a project that I'm currently working on uh, in, 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 in Detroit. As I've mentioned earlier on, um, you know, community discovers the strengths that they have within sort of the traditional, you know, child care practices. Um, and, you know, particularly in Zimbabwe, what I was working with and I've been working with these communities for the past 12 years is that they shouldn't come from a deficit-based perspective. They shouldn't come from, a, we need food coming you know, from the Canadian government. We need support from the Canadian government or we need support from the US government or we need support from the, you know, uh, the Department for International Development, the DFID as it was formerly known uh, in the UK. I challenged the communities and said, as Zimbabweans, what is it that you can do for yourselves, for your own children, so that they're able to realize the ability uh, of, you know, uh, uh, of, of community development, that they're able to realize what they can do for them for themselves. And so within that, 
uh, was, you know, community members, you know, collectively visualizing, uh, you know, the best future state for their children uh, based on either expanding current strengths, you know, in terms of, you know, we're able to provide, you know, tell stories for our young children. We can't buy books, but we can tell stories for our young children. Uh, we can't, you know, buy them toys, but we can play traditional games. We can't do um, you know, sort of take them out to go to the park, but probably we can help uh, to develop a community play center. Um, how do we design the strategies with these communities and how do they, do they deliver and implement uh, the strategy? Now, uh, for a long time, you know, many of the issues that have been within the developing countries, I must say, are coming from, you know, sort of trying to, uh, to to move away from colonial legacy, you know, move away from sort of, you know, Western hegemony and, and sort of um, control and begin to sort of exercise, hey, before we were colonized, we used to practice and play traditional games. We used to do this. And then when we were colonized, we were told that our ways were barbaric. We were told that our ways were backward. And so we had to take our children into formalized, you know, daycare centers or into formalized uh, preschool settings. But we know we can do this if we follow our traditional uh, mechanisms. And so these are the strengths that I begin to sort of try and unpack, you know, within the membership, uh, within the people that we, we, we speak to. And so starting with Zimbabwe, for example, um, the Naga Foundation, uh, you can visit, you know, the website uh, and you can visit the Facebook page uh, to be able to see some of, you know, the issues that I'm talking about and how, you know, the communities have responded. Uh, one of the challenges was access to education. Um, as a community that I visited actually in January, just before the travel restrictions uh, kicked in, I was out in Africa, in Zimbabwe, went to a certain community, um, and I'll try and tell, you know, uh, we say that, a, you know, a picture says a thousand words, and so I'll try and tell a story uh, through these, uh, these pictures. And so we visited this school um, out in rural Zimbabwe, um, I was just as a Zimbabwean, um, I was sort of, you know, really appalled by the conditions that I saw there. Um, this is a water tank uh, that was supposed to be supplying school uh, water to a school that has 300 kids. Uh, the well had dried up, so there was no water coming up. So you have a tank. Um, if you see there, there was a pipe that was supposed to be coming down, but it's no longer there. And so the children really, uh, during the day, have got no access to water. Um, so you are in Canada or you're in the US or you're in a developed country, you know, kids can just walk out of their classroom and go to a water fountain and, and have some water. But that's not a reality, you know, for, for many of our kids, you know, out in the rest of the world. And so I said, okay, all okay, right, there's, there's an issue with, uh, with, with, with water here. Um, and then uh, sort of as I was touring the school, I uh, was taken, you know, sort of to, to this, uh, this is the classroom, right? Um, this is a barn, a tobacco barn. So for those that do not know, Zimbabwe has been, you know, sort of um, uh, a, a really traditionally, you know, farming uh, community. And one of the outputs there is tobacco. Um, and so this was a, you know, commercial farm. And this was a tobacco barn where they used to cure uh, the tobacco. Uh, but what then happened was that, you know, uh, because there were no schools around, this barn was then turned into a classroom. So for many of us, you know, we'll think about, wow, okay, so you were curing tobacco in this barn, and then all of a sudden, you've got 300 kids using this as a classroom. Now, what about, you know, respiratory uh, issues, right? Are the kids going to be smelling the tobacco? Are the teachers going to be smelling the tobacco? What's going to be going on? And so these things were, 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 were running, through, uh, running through my mind as I was visiting uh, this school. Um, and this is in, in, in January. Um, you've got, you know, pictures of kids, you know, waiting their turn to go into class, um, you know, uh, you know to, 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 have, to have their lessons. And then you've got... Um, Again, just sort of zapping through uh, the photos there, uh, you, you can clearly see sort of the state uh, of, 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 of the classroom uh, itself. Um, these are washrooms or restrooms uh, to the left, you know, and to the right, uh, really dilapidated. I took a walk in there and I was like, okay, this is 2020. 
I'm walking into this, the you know, toilet itself is about to fall down. You know, there's so many cracks and it's just a mess, right? I don't want to be too graphic with what I saw in there, but it was just a mess. Um, and I said, as a community, we should have a conversation about this situation and see how best we can we can attend to it, utilizing our own sort of you know re, you know community resources or the resources that are available to us uh, within within this community. Um, and then on the, uh, I'll show you here. Um, let's see, I'll show you here the classroom. Uh, that's inside the classroom. Um, you can see the walls are falling off, um, you know, sort of the infrastructure, the chairs, the tables that the kids are, are, are using. It's really sort of a hazardous environment for young kids to be in. You know, the walls could fall back, they could cave in uh, at any particular time. Um, and I said, this is this is not uh, this is not a good situation. You know, I don't want to be to be in this in this situation. Um, and this is another classroom, as you can see. Uh, the walls are about to cave in, um, but the children are in there uh, in terms of while well, they were outside. But this is the space that they utilize uh, for their learning and for their for their classrooms. And then I went. I went again. I was, uh, you know, taking the tour with 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 the principal uh, of the school. Um, you know, getting statistics, getting information, trying to understand the information a bit. And this is me uh, on the right, just talking to the principal. You know, trying to get some more statistics. How many children are attending in this class? Um, you know, how many teachers are in there? I could smell the the tobacco uh, even as I was there for, for just a moment, I could smell the tobacco, um, you know, smell that, that it be in, had been in there. And not surprisingly, you know, at this particular moment, the principal then said to me, well, you know, Patrick, uh, the challenge that we had is that we actually lost one of our teachers because as they were teaching, they had a respiratory inflammation uh, that led uh, to their death, right? And so because they had an underlying condition and they were assigned to this school and because of the economy and that because she needed to work, unfortunately she was exposed. And so this was a dangerous situation uh, for, for, for her to be in. And unfortunately we lost, uh, we lost, we lost, we lost that life. Um, and so again, as I, as I proceeded with my, with my tour, um, I've shown you sort of photos of, of classrooms and I said, let's, let's have a conversation. Let's talk about this situation. And so we then set up um, a meeting, a community meeting, you know, where we sat down and we said, let's, let's talk about this school. Let's talk about your school. Um, I'm Patrick, I'm a Zimbabwean, um, but I want to talk about you as a community. I want to understand how do you feel about your children, you know, going to school in this, in this, in this classroom. Um, I want to feel about you knowing that a teacher has died because of a respiratory problem that has been caused by them being in a, 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 a classroom that used to be a tobacco treatment sort of, you know, or tobacco curing classroom. How does that make you feel? Can we have, you know, uh, a conversation around this? And so, as I mentioned earlier on that, you know, we, you know, with the appreciative inquiry, the beauty about it is we can have a conversation anyway. So this was under a tree and they'd taken me to say, hey, Patrick, yes, we understand your concerns and what you're saying, but we've got a school site that we were given, but we don't have money, you know, to build a school. And I said, okay, let's, let's have a conversation. Can we call for a meeting? Um, I had gone in there for a three week visit and I said, okay, let's, let's organize ourselves and let's call for a meeting and let's, I wanna unpack this, uh, for you so that, you know, you give me the picture, you tell me the resources that you have, the resources that you don't have, and then we see what we can do for our, our kids. And so uh, the chief called for a meeting and we sat around a tree and we, we started having our conversations. And I began you know, sort of to facilitate and ask you sort of really you know, the difficult questions, right? Why are we where we are today? Why do we have children learning in a tobacco barn? Why do we have a teacher dying because of a respiratory disease um, that is then linked to them having to sort of, you know, breathe in the air that is coming through from this, from this barn. Um, very attentive, uh, very, you know, participatory conversation, very, um, you know, sort of honest, straightforward uh, feedback. Um, so you had various generations uh, coming through. You had grandmothers coming through with their daughters who now had children 
uh, attending that school. You had, for example, this woman uh, who's to the left, and I would love for you uh, to pay attention to her because she's done something that's been remarkable since our appreciative inquiry session with her. Um, you know, with a notebook, taking notes, and the lady to the right, extreme right as well, with a notebook, taking notes, uh, trying to understand how best they can come up uh, with a solution, not to wait uh, for outside help, but begin to think about a solution. And the beauty uh, for me about appreciative inquiry is that it allows you to unpack you know, the difficult questions in a way that people begin to think about the positive situation. So I say to them, you know, for example, what is it that you used to do traditionally to look after children, to ensure that children were cared for and to ensure that children were attending class? Um, and this would be, oh, you know what? We actually never used to have buildings, Patrick. We used to sit under a tree. We used to have a grandmother or a senior person from the village or the chief come in and walk through our own indigenous sort of pedagogical, you know, process where we'll teach them about games and stories and, you know, we'll begin to sort of, you know, have folklore stories that will teach these uh, kids. And, um, you know, I managed to catch, for example, uh, this woman here sort of thinking, right, uh, thinking through this process, thinking through about the questions that I was posing uh, to them. Uh, they brought along with them their grandkids um, again, to this, because, you know, they're sort of the caregivers and looking after grandkids and so many a time, sometimes they've lost their children, um, you know, uh, mostly sometimes due to HIV and AIDS and, 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 and related uh, issues. And so they are caring after these young grand, grand kids. And so they came and they were, they were thinking through uh, what they were doing traditionally uh, to look after kids. And um, through these conversations again, I would, I would note the different ones, you know, the different ones that are thinking are trying to process this conversation and saying, hey, hold on. Yeah, we can look after our own, you know, grandkids, we can look after our own children, we can create a better situation uh, than we have currently. And, and so move from these conversations, then I'll share these slides uh, with, with, with Carly for onward, uh, for onward uh, distribution. Uh, we've got, you know, permission, uh, you know, through uh, sort of signed consent forms, you know, by the participants of these meetings. Um, and so after this meeting, we began to have an action step. We said, okay, so they said, Patrick, we can mold bricks. We can actually mold bricks to build our own school. We can actually mobilize ourselves to be the labor that can come in and ferry the bricks to the building site. We can actually mobilize ourselves to begin to build in. We've got, oh, this guy is a builder. This guy has worked at a building site. So they can come in and provide the labor. So we actually don't need the money to pay laborers to build the school. We will work with the ministry. We'll ensure that we've got you know, the right plans in terms of the architectural design. So the classrooms that are approved by the ministry. And then from then on, we just need support in having cement and we need support in having an, you know, a reliable water source, and we need support in ensuring that we've got um, access to, to just a little bit of funding that, that will help cover some of the costs that the builders have. And I said, okay, so with NACA Foundation, we're able to help you with some of things, but before we come in with financial support, we need to agree at this particular meeting, what are the things that you're bringing to the table? So off the top, they said, we've got our labor, so we'll bring in our, our free labor. We've got access to pit sand. We've got access to other raw materials that we can use to build a new classroom, a new classroom and a new school for our kids. And so I said, okay, fantastic. So let's begin this process. And so over the past uh, seven months, we've then began the process of ensuring that we're building an entirely new school, uh, an entirely new feeding uh, garden for the kids and entirely sort of you know, drilling a new well that you know, provides access uh, to water. Uh, clean uh, water for, for, for the children as well as uh, for the building site. And so some of the photos you see here uh, uh, are, you know, builders working uh, at the building site at the new uh, school that's being, you know, constructed. Um, you've got a garden here uh, to the extreme left, far left, you see a new water tank that's been put up. We've put up a well. Um, at the background there, you see the school that's coming up and then just in the immediate foreground, you can see a sort of a feeding a hut or a feeding shed. Um, and then immediately in front of you, you can see the, uh, the new school vegetable garden. And I'll tell the story uh, as, we, as, we, as we move. 
um, and then recently um, there was now, as you can see, the parents again came together and said, we've got a plantation, we're gonna, for every tree that we are cutting, we are gonna plant a new seedling. So each of the you know, trees that were being cut, they were replacing that. And the team at Naka Foundation is ensured that there's been a replacement of for those trees and they've used that material uh, to then build a play center for their children. They said, well, we are on saviors, Patrick. We've realized that with you know, the process that you have taken us through, that we shouldn't wait for outside help, that we should actually use the resources that we have. And this is what we've been doing traditionally anyway. And so they began to make some play centers using you know, sort of the material uh, that they can uh, get from their own uh, communities. Uh, this is a picture of one of the classrooms. Again, you know, as you can see, this is you know, within the COVID pandemic, uh, people are socially sort of you know, distanced. Uh, and one of the team members uh, from Naga Foundation is sort of facilitating a conversation to say, yes, where we are now. You know, we've got a building that is halfway up. And so what is the next step and how do we, uh, how do we, move, how do we move forward? Um, and then within this context as well, um, I will share uh, as we move, you can see uh, just in this picture now, sort of the playground. Look, it's not what you would want to see, sort of, you know, in the West, you would see different things. So if I go down to Beacon Hill Park and I go to the playground, I see a different set of equipment, right? But this is what the community has managed to produce by themselves, for themselves and for their children. Right, so they've got A-frames. Children can run up and play up the A-frames, you know, different sizes for different kids. They've got, you know, a, a pit sand uh, that they can play out of and be able to, to have fun. And in the background there is that, you know, sort of new school uh, classrooms coming up. And then uh, further down, you can see the garden and the, and the water tank. This is coming through from sort of community uh, generated labor and, and conversations and, and the dream. So we've went through the 4Ds and then now saying, hey, we can actually do this uh, by, by ourselves as long as we get sort of a little nudge uh, and a little bit of, of, of sort of financial support. Um, uh, I'll show you a photo here. This shows just, you know, uh, the water tank that Naka Foundation and then the team managed to, to, to put up, you know, with funding that we identified. And then to the right, you can see a solar array. And with that solar array, we then put and installed a solar water pump. And so the water pump pumps water into that water tank for storage. And then immediately you can see that lady with the sort of a, uh, uh, a yellow uh, wrap around there drawing water from a, from a water faucet. And that's something that the community had never done before, but we've got gravity fed. So we've got, let's start from the beginning. We've got, you know, power that's being drawn from the solar, uh, solar array that's, you know, pumping the water into the tank. And then we've got a gravity fed tank, water tank that's supplying water uh, to that water faucet. And then they connect uh, a hose that then takes uh, the water to, uh, to the garden. Um, and then I'll quickly move through uh, to the next sort of slide, uh, the next sort of photos where uh, these are photos that I just received uh, this week on Monday. They've now started roofing. We've obviously sort of worked to identify some funding support to buy the roofing materials uh, and the other things that they need and to bring in a sort of a professional carpenter who then helps to ensure that uh, the roof uh, is put up. But the school is, is, is coming up uh, uh, slowly and so from a distance these we've got um, one two three of what about six classrooms that are coming up uh, at that school that will ensure that the children are moving away completely and I'm hoping I've given the team uh, a December 31st deadline where I'm saying that the you know third of January the school the children should be going into a fresh brand new classroom where they're able to learn and able to move forward and all of this has been done uh, because of you know, the, 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 the knowledge that the community has had uh, through appreciative uh, inquiry. Um, and so with these conversations, the community said our children are living in a, are learning in a very bad space. So they're learning in an environment where there is no, uh, the, the, you know, they might have respiratory issues where children with asthma might be affected because of the tobacco. But we are also living in a situation where children are going to bed hungry. And so the question that I posed to the community during that appreciative inquiry session, I said, what is it that you used to do back in the day that we can tap into? What is the positive thing that we used to do back in the day that we can tap into? And 
after a few, you know, sort of back and forth and back and forth, the woman that I earlier on highlighted said, hey, by the way, we used to have a traditional community-based feeding program that was coming from uh, the, the land that was allocated by the chief specifically for orphans and vulnerable children. So Patrick, if we could have support to fence off a certain piece of this land from you know, wild animals, we want to be able to reproduce that idea because it used to work when I was growing up. That's what she said. She said, it used to work for us. And so can we have support to fence off a garden? Can we have support to have a sustainable water source? And can we have a little support to buy some seedlings so that we start up a garden? And I said, well, interesting. You can have all that support, hypothetically. What commitment do you have as a community to ensure that this garden is going to work? They said, Patrick, we are here 100%. We are poor people, but we are not poor when it comes to our power. We're not poor when it comes to our applying our mind to the things that help our children. And so I'll quickly show you some photos of the journey that, you know, that, that, that we then started. And so the vegetable garden that I, sh I showed you that was fenced, um, you know, started off and they said, well, we don't have, we don't have fertilizers. We don't have, and I said, well, before you had fertilizers, what is it that you used? And they said, well, actually we used to use, you know, uh, organic manure. We used to use manure from our cow pens. We used to use manure that was coming in uh, from our goat pens. And I said, yes, let's use that because I'm an organic person. I, I believe so much in using organic fertilizers. So we are not gonna help you buy fertilizers, you know, that are produced in an industry. But if you have the cows that you have, if you have the goats that you have, they are making droppings every night. That's organic fertilizer. So let's take that and begin to use that in our garden. And so they began, as you can see in these you know, photos, began to take you know, the, the, the goat, uh, the goat uh, droppings and, and the cow dung and begin to use them uh, for, 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 for the garden. And um, the garden has been a fully sort of flourished garden. Immediately in front of you, you can see some kale. So that's kale. Um, and where that young man is, uh, the top right uh, are some mustard, uh, mustard greens. Uh, and then in the far right, you can see some tomato, uh, some tomato plants coming up. And then in the extreme stream right, you can see a pile there. That's a sort of an organic uh, compost uh, or manure that is being you know, put together there. And what's coming out of there is being used to sort of put into the vegetable, uh, vegetable gardens. And so they began that process, you know, just as Corona was, uh, the Corona pandemic was, was, was kicking in. And, um, you know, the team continued to provide support. Um, you know, that's the team, part of the NACA team going out to see and help with technical support. Uh, in the immediate foreground, you can see some, you know, beans uh, that are being grown. And then to the left, there's some kale, extreme left, there's some mustard greens, as well as, you know, in front of you, there's some mustard greens. These are just sort of different angles of, um, of that garden. As, 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 as the corona pandemic kicked in, the problem then became, well, the kids are not coming to school and they're not accessing uh, the vegetables. And I said, over the phone, I said to the team, well, can you go back and have another session, another meeting? What is it that we used to do traditionally when we had an oversupply or an abundance of vegetables? And they came back and like, well, wow, you know, we actually used to dry vegetables. We need to, you know, sort of just cut them up, boil them a bit, and then put them out to dry and sun dry them. And they started saying, hey, because the government has said the schools are closed because of the pandemic, we're not going to put any of our vegetables to waste. We're going to dry these vegetables. And so they started drying them. And so in the far, uh, just, you know, the far picture there will show you uh, vegetables that were, you know, halfway through the drying process. And then immediately in front of you, you can see vegetables that were uh, starting to dry up. And this is kale uh, that was starting to dry up. And I did mention uh, earlier on that I needed you to pay attention to that lady. This is the lady that has taken charge of the entire nutrition garden project. She said, this is my passion. I don't need to be paid by anyone to feed my kids. I don't need to be paid by anyone uh, to, to feed you know, orphans or to feed the vulnerable children in our community. This is what I'm gonna do. And so she's taken lead uh, in terms of you know, the vegetable drying, in terms of ensuring that 
you know whatever is coming out of the veg of, of the nutrition garden is dried up and is is well uh, sort of stored and 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 then dried. And with that, we then said, well, the children are not in school, so how best do we ensure that the food goes to the children? And um, and then the idea came uh, through the community uh, meetings, and they said, well, why don't you help us produce a food pack? And the food pack will consist of, so on the bottom there, the white stuff is a cornmeal, which is our starch, our traditional starch. starch. Uh, we make uh, a thick porridge out of this, and with the vegetables, the thick porridge and the vegetables make the traditional sort of Zimbabwean meal. Uh, it's called sadza, uh, and then you have it with, with, with the relish. And you can see within the, if you look closely in that, you can see some red there. These are tomatoes that came from that garden. So you've got kale that is parboiled with, uh, uh, with tomatoes and with a little bit of oil, there's a sachet uh, of oil behind there. And so the family that receives this food pack are quickly able to make a meal and able to feed, uh, to feed, to feed their children. And so going through uh, this, uh, you can see again, uh, let me go here. The computer is, you've got a staff member uh, from, you know, the organization uh, on our motorbike, you know, we've given, we've got two field officers that go on a motorbike um, sort of delivering food packs to the different children so that they're able to access food even in the middle of the pandemic. And all of this is 100% coming from the nutrition garden at the school. So it took an appreciative inquiry session to have conversations around how best can we, uh, can the communities feed children using the resources that they have uh, in, 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 in their hands. And as you can see here, this is that lady again, that I started off with, who is now distributing food from the garden. So you've got vegetables and a bit of soya to provide uh, protein um, and the cornmeal, and she's distributing food to the kids, to the orphans and vulnerable children in her community. And this is 100% a conversation that started in the community, a conversation in the story that is happening in the community. So I didn't want to present to you all an abstract application of appreciative inquiry. I wanted to present a real, uh, you know, sort of practical example. As you can see, uh, the kids are wearing, you know, face masks and, 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 and so too are the, are the adults. This is happening right now uh, in the midst of this, of this uh, pandemic uh, that we have. And so the last sort of uh, practical example I'll show you is from another you know, different district where again, we had a community meeting, again, sit around a circle in a classroom and we said, hey, I wanna facilitate a conversation. This is in 2020 in January in a different community, a different side of the country. And I said, let's facilitate a conversation with my team about how best you know, what are the positive core? What is it that we have as a positive in this community that can help us to, to, to move forward? And so sort of similar issues, but, you know, sort of different ways of, 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 of addressing the issues. So the community, again, coming in uh, to sort of make, uh, you know, play uh, pit, pit sands and, you know, pit boxes for the kids to play in. Um, here you have a sort of a semi, you know, finished, uh, semi finished sort of pit sand. All they needed to do here was to add in the sand for the kids to come in and play. And then um, you do have sort of, again, in front of us here, uh, the A-frames, you know, sort of the A-frame uh, play, you know, equipment. This is not, again, what you'd see in Beacon Hill Park here in, in, in Victoria along Cook Street, but, you know, this is what we have. And we said, let's do with what we have as, 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 as a community. Um, and then you've got a brand new classroom. Uh, let me show you a, a picture as well. Um, that has been built with the community, by the community, with community efforts and with funding that we have sort of managed to look for through NACA Foundation. Uh, at this community, which is about 400 miles uh, or 400 kilometers east of the capital city of Zimbabwe, where again, you have a community-led initiative where we are supporting some of the resources. They are coming in with labor. They are coming in with you know, the human resources to help build a school for their uh, uh, for their children. Um, and then uh, just the last picture there, you'll be able to see uh, sort of the, you know, classroom in the background and then the play center for the, uh, for, for the, for the little children uh, at, the, at the back of it.
And so these are real practical sort of examples. I could give you many, but I can make reference for you to visit uh, the Naga Foundation website, uh, you know, or the Facebook page for you to get uh, sort of some more information. Um, and so how does that apply to North America? How does that apply to Euro North America? And uh, again, you know, I was privileged and I've been privileged to work with the community uh, in Michigan and, and in Detroit to begin to have, you know, appreciative inquiry conversations. Um, as you know, there have been issues that are going on, you know, regarding equity and justice and, you know, access to resources. Um, and, 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 and here we have sort of some work in Detroit. Um, I'm going to quickly uh, sort of, you know, show you some of the issues here. Um, I was privileged to work to develop and implement, you know, what is now called the Detroit Champions for Hope Network. Um, the leaders, the community leaders are in the process of, you know, having a, you know, registering a 501c3 uh, or a tax deductible sort of organization that allows them to sort of, you know, receive donations and support or grants from the communities. Um, but we started off, you know, in November 2022, having a summit, an appreciative inquiry summit, where we brought again, you know, the community members from Detroit, from the seven districts of Detroit that we're working in, uh, to have a conversation. Again, same questions I asked in Zimbabwe are the same questions I asked in America, in North America, same questions I asked in Detroit. What is it that you traditionally did as a community to look after your own children? And they say, well, Patrick, if we had some resources, we could do this. If we had some resources, we could do this. And said, okay, let's let's have a conversation. And so ideas floated and we began sort of to attract some support uh, from the Kellogg Foundation and the Kresge Foundation, uh, who then came in to say, okay, let's actualize this and begin to help these communities to, to, to move forward. Um, again, this is not last year. This is a process that I'm working through with this community. Uh, this is a sort of a screenshot of our, you know, Zoom meeting that we had earlier on this year uh, with Monique and Tamika and Kamara, uh, with Elizabeth, you know, multiracial group of people coming in to say, hey, let's have a conversation of how best we can uh, look after our children uh, in, in, in Detroit. And so I'm going to share just a short video. Um, it's probably about six minutes long, but I'm going to uh, if you allow, I'm just going to, you know, sort of, you know, push it forward a bit so that it takes us about sort of one, one and a half or two minutes. But I just want you to understand the, the essence of the story and how the communities uh, have also risen up uh, to support their, their children uh, here in, 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 in Detroit. Patrick is back here. Hello, Patrick. Can you hear us? Hello. I am Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. We, we can hear you as well. Well, at this time, I believe maybe it may be a you know, wise idea to skip the yeah. video because yes. it already failed us twice. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, yeah, uh, but uh, please go ahead. Sure, my, my apologies about that. And I'll just skip the video entirely. Um, I did not have much left on my presentation and I'm really afraid to start it now because it might give us problems again. Um, but basically I was running through to the end of my presentation and what I just wanted to share really were sort of lessons learned. Um, and I, I don't know if these are coming up, but I'll, I'll avoid sort of uh, having them being, being blown up because of uh, the issues that we have. And so the lessons learned for me really uh, from the field have been Firstly, the power of having unconditional positive question where we uh, go into a situation and we are asking the right questions and we're making sure that we've got this unconditional positive regard. We are able to ask questions without having any preconceived notions. And secondly, my lessons from the field has been our positive images of the future lead our positive actions. And so we talk about words create worlds. I hope I got that right, right? Words create worlds. And so when we talk to communities and to talk to families and, and, and individuals, if they create a positive and a great world for themselves, then we can always work with them and join together on that journey towards that positive world. And the last thing that, you know, has sort of come out from my personal learning has been, uh, or at least from a field experience is that there's a lot of good things that can come out of people. 
the best is in people. We need to believe in people that, and, and to have this concept of wholeness that, you know, knowing that wholeness heals. Once we appreciate people for who they are, what they bring to the table, we are able uh, to take a lot of learning. And for me, uh, as Patrick, being a student all the time, being humble, being open, being teachable, being curious, being, you know, able to ask more questions. Oh, so how did you do it 20 years ago? How did you do it 30 years ago? Oh, okay. And always knowing that you are learning something each new day. Um, earlier on, I was in a meeting with a colleague and he was asking me about my experiences with my dissertation. And I said, you know what, to be frank, Ivan, I've gotten to a stage where I realized that I know nothing. So as much as I've read so many books, some of which are behind me, some of which are scattered around me, I just know nothing. Because the more I'm curious, the more I'm inquisitive, the more I inquire, the more I am, you know, get this new knowledge being revealed to me. So that has been learning for me. Um, and also just letting go of a deficit-based perspective, just changing my vocabulary completely, just changing it. The glass is never half empty, Patrick. The glass is half full. So start from where you are and move forward. Work with the communities from where they are and move forward. So changing that vocabulary and having more a positive, you know, sort of vocabulary um, has certainly helped in this journey within appreciative inquiry. The big shift, what I want to call the big shift, is that I've moved from going to the communities with a message you know, going to say, here we are as an organization, as an individual, we want to be able to help you walk through situations. Um, I used to have a boss many years ago uh, from, from, from the US who told me, Patrick, we are going into these communities to firefight. We're going in, you know, as firemen, we're going in uh, to, you know, to, to douse the fire as it were. And I've gotten to a stage where I've realized, no, it's not about taking that message. It's about going to have a conversation going to talk to the communities and understanding. So you might look at a community as an abstract, but you also wanna look at a community as a family. How are we having conversations within our families and how are we able to move from a deficit to a you know, positive uh, you know, sort of thinking uh, perspective? We've got a whole lot of things that are going on in the world right now. You know, We look at next door, the coronavirus and how it's just gone up and all these kind of things, politics. You know, we had elections in BC uh, recently, uh, just this past weekend, and we've got elections coming around. In the, so there are a lot of things that are going on, but how do we use our positive vocabulary to say, hey, we will land in a good place. At some stage, whatever a good place is, we will land in a good place. Um, and then the last thing as well, you know, the big shift for me is how do you move from an expert solution to a community-driven solution? Decisions are made at a local level but we can support with resources at a top level. So how do we go out into these communities to ask them and inquire and get them to make the decisions? And then we go back. So for example, where I am in British Columbia, uh, the capital city is in Victoria. So how do we go out to the different uh, towns and cities and inquire and get you know, information and then come back to Victoria and say, hey, this is what the communities are saying. This is what they want. So how do we ensure that they've got the necessary resources to support the decisions that are being made at a community, at a community level? That will allow us uh, to be uh, able to move forward. And so in conclusion, our inquiry must be the change we want to see in the world. Our inquiry must be the change we wish to see in the world. Earlier on, I, I, I mentioned that an answer is as good as the question that is asked. So many times, if we ask a question without really thinking through that question, we'll get the answer that just you know, comes up. But if we are thoughtful about the question, then we'll get a very good uh, response. And so Albert Einstein, uh, who I love reading his work a lot, said that there are two ways to live your life. One is though nothing is a miracle, and the other is though everything is a miracle. And so I, I present to you appreciative inquiry. I present to you uh, just an inquiry, a strength-based perspective uh, to begin to think and to utilize as we go about in our daily uh, living. Thank you, um, Fali, over to you. So thank you, Patrick, for thank you again for this enlightening and 
entertaining presentation. As I mentioned at the beginning, we are Canada's only national nonprofit for science and free thought. We hope that those of you who are not already members will consider purchasing a membership. We will include a link to our membership page in the chat window and the video description and through Meetup. I hope that you will consider joining. Not only does your membership provide financial support to CFIC, it also adds your voice to that of others who support science, critical thinking, and secularism. As we grow in numbers, so does our influence with government decision makers and the public opinion that guides them. We advocate for evidence-based decisions on government policy, healthcare, public education, and human rights. If concerns like climate change, blasphemy laws, education curriculum, medical pseudoscience are important to you, please become a CFIC member. Today's landscape, there are too many people spreading misinformation and trying to mislead you. Without us, the major influencers will continue to be the large self-interested groups and institutions that benefit from making baseless claims and spreading pseudo-scientific nonsense. So please consider a membership. It's only $30 per year. Our next event will be on November 8th, Sunday, 1 p.m. PST. It's about the political turmoil in Turkey. And uh, next event after that, the next major event will be on December 10th, which is the Protecting Blasphemers 2. Protecting Blasphemers is an annual panel discussion highlighting the most recent blasphemy cases of the year. And we aim to discover the areas where the global secular community <laughs> needs to make progress in terms of building support mechanisms in order to protect blasphemers. I encourage you to follow all of our CFIC Victoria and virtual branch social media platforms and to sign up for the CFIC newsletter if you wish to keep being informed about our future events ahead of time. Finally, I would like to thank the CFIC Victoria and virtual branch volunteers who pulled this event together. If you would like to volunteer with CFIC, you can sign up on our website there are many interesting positions for you to choose from. Now I'm going to unmute all of your microphones and let's uh, please give our speaker a big round of applause. And here, let's see uh, if we can take advantage. You unmute. Huh? Unmute your just open. It is unmuted. Yes, now everybody, oops. I have unmuted everybody now sorry for the delay so let's please give our speaker a round of applause and thank you thank you patrick so much, thank you, very much. you might even consider changing the the name of this to the center for appreciative inquiry canada now. that's beautiful <laughs> yes thank you very much and thank you patrick great night everyone until next time take care Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.